Uh, oh, thank you, Micah. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for taking the time today. Uh, we're really, really excited uh, to have Susan Woolley here with uh, the, the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries to talk to us about uh, prevailing wage rate law here in Oregon. Um, you know, my name is Rick uh, Rizika. I'm with Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, and I'm, I'm just here to introduce Susan and we'll turn it over to her. I uh, just kind of want to um, lay a couple ground rules here for everyone. Um, I think the way we'd like to do this is um, uh, instead of having people come off mute during the presentation, feel free to uh, put something into the chat and um, and Susan and, and, and our team will We'll uh, check on that every so often and um, actually has an opportunity to answer those as we go through because we don't want you to forget your question. And then um, once uh, the presentation is over, I think we'll have enough time, uh, hopefully, to uh, allow folks to ask questions. And then at that point, feel free to raise your hand and come off mute. Um, but we just love it if everybody would remain on mute um, so that we don't have any background noise and that kind of thing during the presentation itself. Um, and yeah, and, and with that, um, I think this is the first time that I've, I'm aware of that we've had um, this kind of joint collaborative with, uh, with Boley. So excited to have him here and talk about uh, prevailing wage rate. I will say that uh, one of the uh, kind of initiatives or reasons that we, we started this discussion with them is because of our co-location initiative, um, co-locating um, uh, child care facilities with uh, affordable housing. And with, with that initiative, if you're interested in that, when, when um, that drops, um, prevailing wage rate is something that you need to be aware of. And those of you in Portland are probably already aware of it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think this 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 training is timely and appropriate, and just really excited about all the folks that we have here today. So, with that, Susan, welcome, and thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> thank you, Rick. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm. I was telling Rick earlier. I. I wish I would have thought of this. This is a great idea. So I hope you do have questions. I think there will be plenty of time to ask them. Um, and as Rick said, feel free to type in the chat as we go through and I'll answer the questions as you have them. And then we should have some time at the end also to um, catch up on any other questions that we missed. So these are our topics that we'll go through today. Just about a little bit about the basics of prevailing wage and we'll talk about the coverage. So what are the triggers for the law and what are the exemptions from the law? Um, we'll talk a little bit about agency responsibilities on these types of projects. There are just a few things that agencies have to do. And then we won't actually go into all the contract responsibilities, but I'll give you the list and show you where you can find more information about those. And the very last slide will have some contact information, both phone numbers and email addresses for us. So these prevailing wage rate laws, they've been around for a while. They were passed back in 1959 for Oregon, and they were based on the Federal Davis-Bacon Act. So if you've ever had to deal with projects subject to the Federal Davis-Bacon Act, you might notice it's real similar to the state PWR laws. In fact, sometimes people will call our laws the Little Davis-Bacon Act. I heard somebody refer to it as the Baby Davis-Bacon Act the other day. So it, it gets some different terminology. We don't have a name for it. We just call them the state prevailing wage rate laws. And once a project is subject to the state prevailing wage laws, we think of coverage kind of like a big umbrella. The laws are going to apply to everybody who's working on that project under that umbrella of coverage. And some contractors might have really big contracts, some have small contracts. It really doesn't matter. Once they're on the project, they are subject to these prevailing wage laws. And this slide shows the reasons behind the laws. And you'll see there are some citations at the bottom of each slide. So ORS is the Oregon Revised Statute. That's part of the PWR law. The legislation, legislators wrote this out to say, okay, we wanna pass these laws and this is why we're gonna do it. So the first is to protect local contractors. The idea is to even the playing field so everybody bids on equal footing for the kind of work that they do. So the rates are set according to the classification 
And the hope is that the local contractors will be more competitive at these bids than contractors who come from further away. If you have a contractor who comes in from Florida, they probably have more expenses than the local contractors will. So there's hopefully gonna be local contractors who end up with the low bids on these projects. And hopefully these local contractors have local employees. And that's a good way to help that public money being used on these projects stay there in the community. On the second part of number two, it says promote local participation. Or I'm sorry, maintain community established compensation standards. That's a fancy way to say, well, we also want the workers to get paid the going rate in the community. And that's where our rate books come in. Those are based on um, the different union rates all around the state of Oregon. The third one, they said we want to encourage training of workers, and that would be through apprenticeship programs. So in Employers can have apprentices that work on these projects. The apprentices get paid less than the full prevailing wage rate. That rate keeps increasing as the apprentice works through their program. And once they graduate, then they get paid the full prevailing wage at that point. And finally, the legislature said, we also want to encourage contractors to provide benefits for their workers. If you've ever seen the prevailing wage rate, you might've noticed it's made up of a base rate plus a fringe rate. And it's the combination of those two that needs to be paid to the worker in some form. Some contractors pay the full base plus fringe directly to the worker's wages. Some contractors pay that entire fringe amount into different benefit programs like medical insurance, dental insurance, retirement, vacation. Um, either way is fine, but the legislature did want to encourage contractors to actually provide benefits for the workers and using that fringe portion to cover part of that. Okay, so then let's get into the good stuff. The coverage of prevailing wage rate law, we always start with what we call this two-step test. The first step is to look to see, does the definition of public works apply to that project? If it doesn't, you don't have to go any further. You don't have a public works project. There's no prevailing wage rate laws required. If the definition of that public works term does apply, there's a second step to look for the exemptions from the law to see if one of those might apply. So let's look first at this term public works. And this is defined in our PWR statute. This tends to be a part of the statute that gets tweaked by the legislature. So this part A, this used to be it for prevailing wage projects. It says it's the construction, reconstruction, major renovation or painting that is carried on or contracted for by a public agency to serve the public interest. But then over the years, this definition has been expanded into parts B, C, D and E. And a couple legislative sessions ago, there was a part F proposed, but the bill didn't pass. So we were stopped at part E still. This is, for Boley, this is the most common types of public works project that you'll see. I think for you guys, it will be the types of public works project that fall under Part B. But I just wanted to touch on this first to go over some of this type of work that we're talking about, because this can apply to other types of projects as well. For construction, reconstruction, major renovation, those are defined terms. So construction means something that's newly built new bridge, new road, a new structure. Reconstruction and major renovation means you have something that already exists and it's being renovated or restored or repaired in some way. And we're pretty broad on what we consider to be a structure. So to give you some of the otter examples, um, we had a land berm once that was being built and we said, yeah, that's a structure. Uh, somebody was asking a question about dredging the river. <laughs> we said, well, yeah, it's a waterway, it's a structure. And I think one of the weirdest ones was a motorhome that was gutted and turned into a mobile computer classroom. And we said, that's a structure too, it's on wheels, but yeah, that's a structure. So all those projects ended up being subject to the prevailing wage law. And this is a great question to ask us. If you're ever not sure about the type of work that's going on, give us a call or email and we can help you out with whether or not 
the type of work will meet these definitions. A painting is not a defined term, but it's just the application of paint to any surface. Could be a building, could be a road, could be a parking lot. Um, all of those would potentially be projects subject to the prevailing wage law. And then, of course, well, here's some examples of what we've seen in the past. Things like repairing a roof, um, even replacing carpeting in a building, or the system's furniture that we sit in when we work in the offices. Even that's considered reconstruction to install or reconfigure those systems furniture. Um, so it the these terms, construction, reconstruction, renovation, or painting might end up applying to things you might not normally think it should. Now this part A of the definition that we've been talking about, these are the types of projects that are carried on or contracted for by public agencies. So they've entered into contracts for construction or they're supervising or managing that project. I'm guessing these probably won't be the types of projects you would deal with. It's probably gonna be these projects that fall under part B of the definition. These types of projects, again, include the same kind of work, construction, reconstruction, major renovation, or painting. But in this case, it's just the dollar threshold of public funds that we'll use. It will use $750,000 or more in funds of a public agency. And we do call these B projects because we, we do see these, well, next to the A projects, we see these probably the most now, there are a few other types of projects that fall under this definition that I wanna cover briefly. Part C, it means it's privately owned construction where a public agency will occupy or use at least a quarter of the square footage of the completed project. We don't see this one a lot. Um, an example could be DMV is going to lease some space in a mall. So it's privately owned space. And if they're going to occupy or use at least 25% of the square footage of that completed project, then that means that project will meet the definition of public works. Part D probably won't apply to you much. It's for the installation or construction of a device that uses solar power if that's done on public property. So if it is on public property, then this type of project will be subject to the prevailing wage rate laws no matter what. There's some exemptions we're gonna talk about in a second, but those exemptions don't apply to this particular piece of the definition of public works. And the last one, it says the construction, reconstruction, renovation, or painting of projects that occur on public university property. So we have our seven state universities around Oregon. There's Oregon State and U of O, Portland State, Eastern Oregon, Western Oregon, Southern Oregon universities, and then Oregon Institute of Technology. So if any of those public universities were lucky enough to have a really wealthy private donor, private donor who said, I will build you this beautiful new um, track and field area and I'll pay for it all privately. You don't have to pay for it yourself. Just by virtue of being done on public university property is the trigger for the prevailing wage rate laws under part E. Okay, so that's just the first step. So even though something might meet the definition of public works, if any of these exemptions that we're gonna talk about apply to the project, the project won't be subject to the prevailing wage laws. The first one is the total project cost. Project cost has to exceed $50,000. And there, there is, oddly enough, there are exceptions to the exemptions now. Those solar projects that I mentioned that are on public property, they don't have to use any public funds and, or I'm sorry, they don't, they don't have to exceed this project cost. I just gave you a heads up on the second exemption. Um, the solar projects on public property, doesn't matter what the cost threshold is. It could be, I mean, I don't know that this would ever happen, but it could be a $5,000 install of solar material. And that would still be subject to the prevailing wage if it's on the um, public property. Most other types of projects will have to then 
exceed that threshold amount. And that threshold does include all the contracts, all the materials, all the supplies necessary for that project. And it is possible to have projects made up of multiple contracts. So we would combine the total of all those contracts for that single project. And if in the totality they exceed $50,000, then they'll all be subject to the prevailing wage rate laws. The second exemption is for projects that don't use any funds of a public agency, if they don't use them either directly or indirectly. And now we have two exceptions to this exemption. The solar projects that I mentioned on public property, they don't have to use any funds of a public agency whatsoever. If they're on public property, they'll still be subject to the prevailing wage laws. The other is the construction work that's done on public university property. So those don't have to use public funds. But every other type of project will have to use at least some public funds, either directly or indirectly. And I wanted to put this slide in here because this can affect some of the projects that I think you'll deal with. This is in statute. It says these types of funds are not considered funds of a public agency. So tax credits and tax abatements, those are not considered funds of a public agency. Now there is somebody who almost every legislative session proposes bills to make a change to this so that they would be considered public funds at least in certain circumstances. But that bill has those bills, they've never passed yet. So at this point, tax credits and tax abatements are still not considered funds of a public agency. If it's money that comes from the sale of bonds that are loaned to a state by a state agency to a private entity, generally those aren't going to be considered funds of a public agency. And what we see sometimes are the pass through revenue bonds or conduit bonds. If the public agency sells land to a private entity, if they sell it at the fair market value, that's not considered using public funds on the property. And then any agency that might pay or waive any building or development permit fees, that's also not considered using public funds on the project. This is the last exemption that I think will generally apply to your projects. It's for the affordable housing type projects. The project has to include residential construction and it has to be privately owned and it has to predominantly provide affordable housing. And so those terms, they do have definitions or in the terms of, in terms of privately owned, it doesn't exactly define it, but it says what it includes. So privately owned can include affordable housing that's owned by a public agency, as long as that property and the structures are leased to a private entity, entity for at least 50 years. This is the more common one that we see the affordable housing is owned by a partnership. And the apartment, we <laughs> can't speak this morning. That partnership includes usually a housing authority, but that housing authority is a minority member. So as long as they are not a majority owner in that partnership, that's still considered to be privately owned. Affordable housing means the occupants' incomes are restricted. If they're renters, the um, incomes can't be greater than 60% of the area median. If they are owners, it does go up to 80% of the area median. And then to be predominantly affordable means at least 60% of those units in the project have to have those restrictions on income. And the last definition is residential construction. And residential construction does include reconstruction, major renovation or painting or well, it, it's all encompassing of that kind of work. And it's on either single family homes or apartment buildings that are not more than four stories in height. Now it can include incidental items like site work and parking lots, utilities, sidewalks, sometimes even streets where in and of themselves, they're not residential, but they are incidental to the residential project. What it wouldn't be able to include would be commercial space. So sometimes we'll see projects that, that are for affordable housing. The first floor though is 
commercial space and the top three floors are residential. So it's a mixed use project. Those types of projects don't meet this definition of residential construction because of the commercial space. And because this definition or this exemption doesn't apply to those projects, then we do go back to the definition of public works to look to see does that definition apply. And if it's a project that uses $750,000 or more in funds of a public agency, it meets the definition of public works, which means it would be subject to the prevailing wage rate laws. Oh, what a good question. So Josh asked, can I expand on why the apartment buildings are capped at four stories? Why couldn't a five or six story apartment qualify as residential? Well, if you go back to this statute, you'll see it's, we, we copy our definition right from US Department of Labor basically. So the U, US Department of Labor has set the definition at four stories or less for apartment buildings and that's what we followed. Because our laws are so modeled on theirs, we tend to follow theirs in a lot of areas. Now, it, that's not to say it couldn't change if somebody proposed legislation to make a change to that. So that's a possibility, but right now, because this is in statute, that's what it would take. It would need to be a statutory change. Good question though. And hopefully it makes sense. Does anybody have any other questions that you can think of? You're welcome, Josh. Well, you know, it's I'm fine if something does come up down the road, we can always go back a little bit and cover it. If you do have questions down the road and you want a formal response, um, it's, it's fine to call or email us anytime and we can talk about your projects. But if you do need a formal coverage determination, uh, we do have this process in place for it. The requester has to submit all the information necessary for Bully to make that determination. The nice thing about the formal process, we do need to make the determination within 60 days. I know that's a long time of receiving all the necessary information. Internally, we have our own timeline. We try to do it within 15 days of receiving all that necessary information. We post all of our determinations on the website, so you can see those there. And then anybody who, well, it says anybody who's adversely affected or aggrieved by the determination can request a hearing. Basically, it's anybody who doesn't agree with it can request that hearing. And then we go before an administrative law judge and present the case, each side presents their case and the administrative law judge makes the final determination on it. And Rebecca asks, what's the definition of commercial space? We don't have it defined in statute or rule, but we've looked at it as space that, oh, let me go back up to this definition of residential. If it's not incidental to the residential nature of the project, so for example, say the space is used by not just the residents, but it's also used by the public. That's, that's part of it, that could be commercial space. And it could also be if there's a commercial transaction in the space, like the space is used for um, a hair salon was a question we've had in the past, and there was a charge for both residents and the public to use the hair salon. That's a commercial nature in that, a commercial nature of the um, happenings in that space. So that could also be commercial. Um, one of the things that Rick and I were talking about this morning was the childcare question. And if it's only residential, I mean, if it's only um, childcare for, the children that live there and there is no charge for it, we'd say that's not commercial space, but that's not usually what happens. Usually it's a childcare space that's open to not just the residents because that's it's not really practical to be just for them, but it's open to the neighborhood parents as well. They can bring in their children and then there's usually a charge for that space. So because of that, 
that type of space is considered commercial, which then means the definition of residential no longer applies. So this exemption from the law no longer applies. Oh gosh, here's a question um, that I hope I can answer. On slide 15, the sale of bonds loaned by a state agency to a private entity. Does that include local, local regional agencies or capital S state bonds? So it, because the wording of the statute says that are, they are bonds that are loaned by a state agency to a private entity, they would have to be that type of bond. Now, I'm not sure if it's a capital S state bond because I'm not familiar with that term, but um, it would have to be loaned by a state agency. Hopefully that helps, Rachel. I can do a little digging on that if you want me to find out for sure if that's the type of bonds this statute is talking about. And John, yes, underground parking does count as a story. I know I hate to say that, but um, we've had projects where not just underground parking, but it was a four-story building above ground and it had a full basement below. So we said that basement counts as a story too. So it ended up being a five-story building. Mom, do you have anything to clean? Do you have anything to clean the... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder to please stay on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's funny. I thought I thought there was a question being asked and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. Um, why subsidize child care slots under a nonprofit qualifies commercial space? Um, because there's a commercial transaction that, that going on there. Somebody's paying for that. It's it's not just a community space that's open to residents only. There's a business basically going on there. Susan, to follow up on that question, would um, has, has there been kind of a legal determination that it requires a change in the statute to have a narrow exemption of child care from the commercial space definition or could that well, be a bully? We believe it does. Um, because we follow what US Department of Labor is saying, and they would say that type of a space is commercial, we do think it would take a statutory change. And I believe there is somebody working on that currently for this next legislative session to allow co-location like a child care space to somehow have its own little carve out. And Susan, do you remember, you mentioned this, do you remember what Senator or um, uh, legislators working I hope on that? I'm, I hope it, I have this right. I think it's Steiner Hayward. It was just kind of a brief conversation she had with a few of us, but um, I'm pretty sure that was her name. So, so, so I think what I'm hearing is if that's, if that is, so if you're interested in, in pursuing that, I guess we would encourage you to reach out to, to Senator Steiner Hayward and see how you could get involved in that. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, sure. Now, Jerry, this is a good question. Are private 501c3s considered public agencies? They can be. So there is a, specific definition of public agency. And actually, we can go to that. It's in 279C, 800. That's where the PBR statutes start. Sorry, close your eyes for a second so you don't get dizzy. And then it's 800, subsection 5. So it's the state of Oregon or any political subdivision of the state of Oregon or a county, city, district, authority, public corporation or public entity organized and existing under law or charter or an instrumentality of any of those things. Um, I just had a question last week from a watershed council and they're a nonprofit 
but they also are existing under statute. So they meet our definition of public agency. Again, that was 279C, 800, subsection five. And Robin asked, if your resident services office for residents will also allow area people to use the service and there is no charge, then it's commercial. Well, that kind of depends. Um, that's a good question. We've had one where I think there was, oh shoot, I can't remember the details on the project now, but there was common area space and it was being used about 75% for non-residents and about 25% for residents. And because of that high, high use of non-residents using the space, we said, oh, we, oops, sorry. I went the wrong way, I think. We um, are having a hard time saying that's incidental to the residential nature of the project because it's, if it was mostly residents using the space and just some incidental use of non-residents, we would have an easier time with that. But in this case, it was mostly being used by outside individuals who didn't live there. So we said that's really not incidental to the nature of that resident, residential construction. Oh. Rachel said capital S as in a state agency as opposed to Metro or local government. So yeah, if it's if it's coming through a state agency and it meets the rest of that definition for the type of pass-through bonds or conduit bonds, then that's not gonna be considered funds of a public agency, but that same thing wouldn't apply to Metro or other local governments. Let's see, I'm trying to, I don't, I wanna make sure I didn't miss any. I think this is the last one. What if the hair salon is a training program and no money is charged? Then hmm, I think we'd still need to look at, is it for mostly for residents? That I think we could say that's incidental to the residential nature of that project. If it's mostly a school, that provides training to the students um, and it's open to the public and anybody could use it, that would be difficult to say that's incidental in nature to this residential project. And Robin asked, is Metro public money? It is. So Metro is a local public agency. Um, but bully wouldn't necessarily apply even if less than four stories. So if let's say it uses a million dollars in Metro funds, but the project is only three stories tall and it's all residential. Well, this is assuming there's no commercial space in there um, and it's privately owned, then that exemption would still apply to that project. Does that make sense, Robin? I hope so. Okay, good. You guys have great questions. Did I get them? Did I miss any? Hopefully not. Let me know if you typed in a question and I missed it. Just okay. shout out. I think you're caught up. Good job. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, so back to the coverage determinations, those formal ones that we do. Um, they are on the website. You can always take a look at those to see how we've answered these questions in the past for similar type projects. Or I always tell people, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, that's a great thing to pull up to uh, make you sleepy. So the agencies, on these types of what we call the B projects. So projects that aren't being contracted for by a public agency, but they do use oops, uh, at least $750,000 or more in funds of a public agency. There are some agency requirements on these. 
On the other types of projects that are being contracted for by the agency, there's a whole list of requirements, but there's only four things that agencies have to do on these types of projects. One are some, oh, Dana has a question. If a childcare provider was utilize, utilizing the childcare space for free and a majority of the children served were from the housing development, would that still be considered commercial? I think it probably would. Um, I feel like we're on a little bit of a slippery slope, but it, if it's mostly for the residents there, and there is no charge for it, then we can say, well, there's no commercial transaction going on and it's mostly for the residents. So we could say that's incidental to the nature of that project. Of course, will it stay that way? I don't know. That's something that we haven't had to get into, but, oh, you said there is a charge, just not to the family. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, I okay, I see. So the funds are coming from the subsidy, okay. Yeah, I think we would still say that's commercial. I think we'd say that's a business that's in that space. Um, sorry, I know I feel like I spend a lot of my day giving people news they don't necessarily wanna hear. Well, if the project is subject to prevailing wage, then there are some provisions that need to be in place, language provisions. For the types of projects where the agencies contract for the work, there's a whole list of provisions that have to be in the specifications and in the contracts themselves. But for these B types of projects, this rule says, as long as the agency requires that all the specs and all the contracts include these two requirements, then the agency is done with these language provision requirements. They don't have to meet all the rest of them. So all the specs have to have these two statements. It's one is every worker must be paid not less than the appropriate prevailing wage rate. And then the other is what the applicable prevailing wage rates are for that project. And I don't mean like what's the labor rate or the carpenter rate, but I, what is the rate book that applies to that project? And for these types of projects, the rates are set according to the date the public agency first enters into an agreement with the private entity. And it could be multiple public agencies entering into agreements with the private entity. We always go to the first one, which was the one that first happened. Um, and it does need to be some sort of an agreement, not necessarily just will You've, you've met the criteria to be in the running for these funds, or we'll provide these funds if you do all these types of things. It's generally more of a, you will now receive these funds type of agreement that we're talking about. Now that term agreement isn't defined anywhere. So it, it does make it a little challenging sometimes for us, <clears throat> excuse me, to figure out which one of those agreements talks. That Sarah, good question. <laughs> Can it be an award letter? Um, I would probably say maybe. I would wanna review that award letter to see. Um, some of them have a little bit different language. Some of them are more conditional in nature. Like you, you may get this money if all these other things happen. I would say that's not so much an agreement, but if the award letter is you're getting this money, then I, we would, call that an agreement. And David asked, how often are the wage rates updated? Excellent question. We do update them four times a year, usually. Sometimes it's a little more often than that, but generally four times a year. This is what our website looks like now, if you ever wanted to go to it. To get to the prevailing wage, I think the fastest way is to click on this link right here under the four workers section. It says, should I be getting the prevailing wage? Which takes you to the homepage. Well, I call it the homepage. It's the PWR homepage. And at the very top, there's this link that says finding prevailing wage rates. 
<clears throat> and if you scroll down, you'll see here's all the rates that have come out. We're still seeing the slide, Susan. Uh, we're not seeing really. Uh oh. Yeah. Hmm. Dang. Okay. So does that mean you didn't see the statutes before when I went into the statutes? Well, yeah, I believe that is. We're just just seeing the slot, the thing. The, oh. Yeah. Okay. So let me do this. I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to share again, and let's see if that helps. Oh, I may not have yeah. shared the right place. Did that help? Can you see the the rates listed? We're seeing the prevailing wage rate books and amendments. Okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, um, so you can see it's normally going to be the January rate book, and then an April amendment, and then a July rate book, and then an October amendment. So it's typically those four dates. Um, we are changing the the day it's going to turn into January 5th now instead of January 1st, April 5th, July 5th, October 5th, because of a long story change in the law in how the rates are set. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier for everybody to move it back a few days. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing again so I can share. The screen. Oh, Robin has a good question. Oh, thank you, Ray. Ray posted a link for those rates in the chat. Robin asks, since prevailing wage laws come from Davis Bacon, are they one and the same? No, they're not. They are very similar, but they're not identical. There are some differences between the two. And so for project-based vouchers, that, would, that wouldn't have anything to do with the state prevailing wage laws. It might affect whether or not the federal Davis-Bacon Act applies, but for the state prevailing wage laws, we're always gonna go back to, does it meet the definition of public works? Do any exemptions from the law apply to the project? So the, the vouchers themselves wouldn't affect state law. Okay, perfect. And we're not seeing the presentation, at least I'm not now. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, no worries. <laughs> How about now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Oh gosh. Thank you guys for being patient with my lack of technical knowledge. Um, okay, so back to uh, just a few more agency requirements. There's a couple forms the agency has to fill out. One is a notice of public works form. We call it the WH81 form. These are much more common on the types of projects where the agency contracts for construction, but they are also required even for these B projects where the agency that provided funds for the project would fill out this form. If there were multiple agencies who provided funds, they can talk amongst themselves and decide who wants to do that. Or they can um, divide up the fee too, if they want to, the fee payment. That's the next slide that's coming up. There is a fee that's required for the types of B projects and it's one tenth of 1% of the total project cost. So if multiple agencies are providing money to that project, they can prorate what their portion of that fee is based on how much of the total public funds they gave. There are, there's a form for that too. It's called the WH39 form. And for anybody who needs to do this, we do have a linked version of these forms online in Excel, which is pretty nice. You fill out the WH81 form and it automatically populates the fee payment form for you. And what we see some agencies doing, which is just fine, some agencies will require the recipient of the public funds to pay this fee. Um, and that's okay. It's just if that recipient doesn't pay it, Boley can't enforce that agreement. We can only enforce what's in the statute and the statute says it's the agency that has to pay the fee. So we would require the agency to pay it at that point. 
sorry, there's something else in the chat bar, I think, maybe. Okay, good question, Megan. Megan says, if there's a federal project that requires Davis-Bacon, will that meet state requirements? Is the Davis-Bacon Act more restrictive than state law? Oh, um, no, not necessarily. They're, they each have different areas where they're stricter or less strict. Um, for the most part, as I said, they're, they're the same, which is great. Uh, um, here's a difference in overtime. On the federal side, they say it's overtime after 40 hours in the week. But on Oregon's side, we say overtime is on a daily basis. It's usually after eight hours a day, Monday through, th Monday through Friday, although some people can be on a 410 schedule and then it's overtime after 10 hours in the day. And all hours on weekends are always gonna be overtime. So when a project is subject to both state and federal law at the same time, the contractors have to follow Oregon's stricter overtime requirement. On the Davis-Bacon side, um, they're stricter on frequency of pay. So they pay, they require that workers be paid weekly, where the state says workers can be paid once a month. Their contractors have to follow the federal guidelines and pay weekly. So basically everybody has to look at the requirements for each set of laws and where there's a difference, follow with whichever one is stricter. That same thing applies to the rates. Oh, you're welcome. Um, the rates are probably pretty similar, but they're not identical. So the contractors have to compare the state rate with the federal rate and pay whichever is higher of the two. Okay, I think I've caught up now with the chat again. Good deal. Well, certified payroll, this is the last requirement that the agencies have to deal with. Every contractor, every sub, even on these B projects, they are required to prepare and submit certified payroll. They submit them once a month, which goes back to that law for Oregon that says workers can be paid monthly. So the contractors can submit these reports monthly. They're due by the fifth business day of the following month. And they're supposed to be turned in to the public agency who provided funds for that project. Now that Public agency is not required to do anything with these forms. They don't have to review them, make sure they're correct. They don't even have to hunt down the contractors who haven't submitted them to make sure they turn them in. Each contractor is responsible to turn them in themselves. The one thing the agency does have to do though is hold on to them as public record. So people can ask for copies of those and they would have to make them available according to their public records process. I'm just going to wait and see if there are any other questions about that. Because it, you guys, if you can believe it, we're almost at the end. But that's good. We have lots of time for questions. Um, these contractor responsibilities, I didn't want to go into all of them. But if any of you have questions about any of them, please feel free to ask. It's the same list that applies to the other types of public works projects that are being contracted for by a public agency. So all the same things are required. It's a $30,000 public works bond. Anybody who has to pay prevailing wage has to have that. There has to be some required contract language. They have to post the rates on the project site. And of course they need to pay the correct rates to their workers. There's the overtime component. They have to make sure they're doing that correctly. Fringe benefits, either they pay the full fringe to the worker as wages, or if the company pays for things like medical insurance or they contribute to retirement plans, they can take those contributions for those benefits and calculate what we call a fringe credit. If they do have apprentices, they have to make sure they're paying them correctly. Certified payroll, we touched on that. They have to submit those. Mm, we can cross off that withholding amount. That's only gonna to apply to the prime contractors on these projects, not to the public agencies. And then required records. The contractors do have to keep their certified payroll for at least three years. And they also have to keep all of the documents that back up what's on the certified payroll for at least three years. Although we do recommend 
if the contractors can't, they should keep their records for six years because that's the statute of limitations for wages owed to workers. And if you ever wanted more information about the contractor responsibilities, we do have that on the Peter Bear website. There's the link for it. That's our homepage. And from there, you can get to the Peter Bear Laws Handbook, which is a really great resource for contractors. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Oh, here's a good question. So let me touch on this last link first and then I'll answer that question. We do have some upcoming seminars for contractors. One is tomorrow morning from nine to 12. And right now we are doing webinars. Everything is remotely through Teams. Um, and there's the link if anybody is interested in signing up for any of those. Um, okay, and so don't be sorry, it's, it's really not an obvious question. Uh, they asked, I'm wondering how the level of the wages are set and if they have a mechanism to adjust with inflation over time. They, they basically do. Prior to this year, the rates were set by a survey that was done by employment department. An employment department would send out the survey to contractors all over Oregon asking, what do you pay for the kind of work that you do? And based on those survey responses then, that's how we would end up with the rates in our rate book. But I would mentioned there was legislative change last year um, and it did change the way we set the rates. So based on that legislation, then the rates are set by union collective bargaining agreements. So these are now the rates are all union rates. And so as the union, as the unions go through their collective bargaining process and their rates typically will increase. Um, so there's not an exact correlation to adjustment with inflation, but the union rates will increase as inflation increases. So basically, yeah, the rates will continue to increase over time. You're welcome. This is our contact information. Call us, email us. Um, and I included the US Department of Labor there too, just in case if you did have questions about the Davis-Bacon Act. We, US Department of Labor frowns on us giving out information on the Davis-Bacon Act. So we'll probably typically refer you to them. This is a good resource that they have that's a lot like our prevailing wage rate law handbook. Uh, it's a good resource book with information about what's required of contractors on those projects. So what other questions do you have? There must be more, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, you've had great questions so far. So Dana asked, when the survey was done, we're using a percentile to set the rates. So uh, kind of. these are good questions and they don't have easy answers. Um, the, okay, so let me, I'm starting to get the hang of it. I'm gonna stop sharing and then pull up a different bit of information. And then start sharing again. Hopefully. Oh, I'm almost there, come on. Okay. Can you see the region map, hopefully? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so before this change in the law, those survey responses would all come back to employment department and employment department would divide them up by these 14 different regions. So that's a region, the regions that are divided up by statute. And within a given region, if at least 50% of the hours reported for a certain type of work were union hours, then the union rate was said to prevail. 
if less than 50% of the hours were reported were union hours, then they took an average of what everybody reported for that type of work. So you'd get a mix of sometimes it was a union rate, sometimes it was an average rate. And so the change now basically says, now they're just all union rates. Um, oh gosh, I wish it was the same timeline for every union. It's, in some ways it's made it easier not to have the survey, but in other ways it's difficult because every CBA has its own schedule. They all negotiate at different times, but that's part of, with our changes, we have our January rate book and our July rate book. Those tend to be where the biggest number of changes happen, but the few that miss those big changes, we catch them with the April amendment and the October amendment. So yeah, unfortunately it's, some are the same, but there's a difference for a lot of them. And Brian asked, and I don't know, I don't think we did talk about it. Has there been any legislative in, interest in split wage determinations, like applying bully wage rates to just the commercial, specific commercial aspects of a project? Not that I know of. Um, I think that would be difficult. So we've we've never done split determinations like that before. Once upon a time, for a real short period of time, we would do we gave approval for a couple of projects to have residential rates on part of the building and commercial rates on part of the building. But even that was kind of difficult. That's because when, you, when you're building a building, you know, if the ground floor is commercial, you're doing all the wiring and you're putting in probably elevators and plumbing systems and those serve all the floors, not just the first floor. So it's really hard to break down do those workers get paid prevailing wage or do they not get paid prevailing wage? So I, not that I know of, I don't think there's any legislative interest, but thankfully I actually don't have to stay too current on that. So I can't say never, but I would just say it probably would be difficult to have in reality. Oh, let's see. Sean said the recent Inflation Reduction Act has recently increased federal tax credits for builders developers that meet local prevailing wage. I don't know what requirement is required for that. Oh, do you mean, do you mean, well, those wouldn't be considered public funds, I don't think. And so are you asking Sean if that would, how that would set the rates for a project? And feel free to come off mute, Sean. I, I think we're kind of past Susan's presentation stage. So yeah, feel free to jump in there and ask questions if, if you'd like. So yeah, I don't think- Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, it's not public funds, but it, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's the new energy efficiency tax credits. And so I'm, we're getting a lot of questions of, I, I get a lot of questions. I also work with Oregon um, Housing and Community Service Multifamily Program. And so, you know, what, what contractors or developers wanna know is how do I demonstrate this, right? Like I, I, wanna, I wanna claim this tax credit, but I need to, you know, provide, I, they just wanna make sure that if they need to provide some type of proof that they met that. So I was just curious, if you could give some examples. I know, I know it might vary from, you know, there's lots of ways to demonstrate it. Well, Bully doesn't require any anything that doesn't require that they demonstrate whether or not they're using public funds or even whether or not the project is subject to prevailing wage or not. If they do need something that says whether or not it is subject to prevailing wage, we do that through the formal coverage determination process. Is that what you mean, Sean? Yeah, I mean, really, so if they were to claim like a tax credit, they would then, if they were to get audited, so like what kind of proof would they would they share? It, it would, could it be as simple as like a contract or is there some other, um, so maybe the process you just described is they could show documentation that they followed something similar to that if, if it were a public project as well, because it might be public or private. Yeah, well, if the question is, if, if they got audited for, 
not following the prevailing wage rate laws when they should have. Yeah, or um, if they got audited to say, okay, you, you claim this credit, pro prove it to us, right? You know, so you, you know, because it, it might be hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit. So I, I'm just curious if you ha might have any examples of, of how they would do that. So going through your process might be one way for a, for a public project to say, hey, we submitted this and we got approval, which would be great. It, well, at least it would it would say that whether or not the project is subject to the prevailing wage rate laws, but I yep. it wouldn't tell them whether or not they handled the tax credits correctly because we don't we yeah you know, we don't have any part of that. We would just say, oh, they're tax credits. That means by our definition, they're not funds of a public agency. Yeah, but that makes sense. With the if they follow through a similar process to to demonstrate they're meeting a public um like a public funds requirement of prevailing mm -hmm. wage they could follow something along those lines i'm just yeah. looking for guidance for contractors that have never gone through this that are looking at at how to do that and and all the links you shared as well to the prevailing wage rates and the quarterly updates that's also that's been hugely valuable so thank you for that oh good oh you're very welcome ryan asked in affordable housing the concept of Pro rata allocation, segregation, funding sources is not in common, though complex, like you say. Yeah, I don't know how that would work. I'm, I'm sure there are minds much greater than mine that could figure that out, but um, could be challenging. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just gonna jump in and say there was a question by David. Um, is the contract amount $2,000 or less for exemption for using oh. Davis-Bacon rates on a federal project? Thank you. I missed that. Yeah. yeah, as far as I know, it's $2,000 worth of federal funds to be used on that project. And then those federal funds have to require compliance with the Davis-Bacon Act. So not all federal money does require compliance with that. So it just depends on that money that's coming in. And this is the part where I wince a little bit when I get an answer, because I know US Department of Labor hates us answering those kinds of questions. If you go to this link here, uh, this is a good resource book for the Davis-Bacon Act, and that will probably give you some better information about the triggers for coverage. We're still seeing your map. <laughs> I forgot, I closed it thinking, oh, surely what's behind it will show up now. Uh, um, you've done no. a great job of juggling. I don't know how you're juggling all the balls that you are, so. Oh my you're gosh. You're doing great. You're the best, thank you. Okay, there, now hopefully it's up. Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. And there, my chat is open again. Ray, thank you, you're on top of it, man. He's got the um, link there in the chat as well. I think I'm just looking back. I don't think I missed another question. I think you missed one of mine. Oh no, really? Okay, tell me, what was it? <laughs> well, it's Davis Bacon again, so I probably should just read the, the DOL um, website you just sent. But oh. when, when we're doing a typical tax credit project for affordable housing, is that considered residential rate for Davis Bacon or commercial? As I understand, there's two different ones. Oh. Yeah, there are. So, okay, again, a little caveat that check do check what the u.s department of labor says about this but if the project is residential and meets what davis bacon what the u.s department of labor says is residential so single family homes apartment buildings not one more than four stories high the project can use the federal residential rates and I, and and it's considered residential federal rate rather than federal commercial Davis Bacon rate. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you, Susan. Have you gone to the sam.gov where you can get the federal residential rates? I'm going to look at that as soon as this is over. Yeah. OK, yeah. I've been there before, there. but I'm going to have another look. Yeah. OK. They do tend to be lower usually than some of those commercial rates. I should say sometimes they're lower than the state minimum wage. 
And if you ever see a residential rate like that, the contractors still have to pay not less than the state minimum wage for that type of work. I think it might be roofers and a couple other types of classifications that are really low. Yeah, those are. Yeah, right? I don't know that you'd get anybody to work for that now. Probably not. Um, and you probably shouldn't. <laughs> it's not fair to people. Yeah. Any other questions that I missed? A dumb question, Susan. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with um, some of the exemptions you talked about right away versus um, some of the four stories versus the five story thing. So for example, you'd mentioned that low income housing tax credits are exempt uh, from, they're not considered public funds basically. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody, uh, if one of our developers utilized low income housing tax credits and did not have any other uh, gap funding that were, uh, that was state related. And, and I do know pass through conduits were also exempt. Does do things like um, um, having a first floor um, a commercial space, does that, does that matter to you? Or I, I'm struggling with the relation yeah. between the two. Yeah. It doesn't, that's a great question. Not a dumb question at all. So if it uses just the tax credits and then the pass-through conduit type bonds, and that's the only public funding it uses, by, by our definition of what funds of a public agency are not, that project doesn't use any public funds. So it doesn't matter how tall it is, it doesn't matter how much commercial space it has, it's not gonna be subject to the state prevailing wage laws. So it's really just the gap financing that's going to kick in the prevailing wage rate laws. Yeah. So if they have mm -hmm. um, lift probably or or um, yeah lift um, GHAP or mm -hmm. something like that. We see home funds, okay. multifamily yep. energy. Yeah. That was a good question. <laughs> it it didn't make a lot of sense <laughs> in my mind. So thank you for clarifying it. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions before we close up? We have a little bit of time left, so floor is open. Natasha's been teaching me about long pauses. I'm not very good at them yet, but um, <laughs> supposed to give a long pause. Yeah, I'm not great at that either. <laughs> Well, keep my contact information. Yeah. You know, maybe there are questions that people might not want to ask in a group setting. So feel free to reach out. Um, I think for this group, probably I'm the best contact for your questions because I have a feeling your questions will be more difficult than the regular questions that we get. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to help you if I can, even if I don't give you the answer that you want to hear. Just a huge thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. This was so awesome. Oh, Robin, looks like you're coming off. Do you have a question? Nope. I was nope. just gonna. Okay. I was just gonna say thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the good questions. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, this will be this is being recorded. And so if you ever want to, we'll, we'll post this on our website. So if you forgot a question or want help with a website or whatever, uh, need a phone number, uh, feel free to jump on that. Um, and yeah, um, you know, um, just appreciate your interest and, and, um, and thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Thanks, you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for not shooting the messenger. I appreciate that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take bye -bye. care. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah.